Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Jonathan Schutz, and I won't take too long introducing myself. I'm at um, Stellenbosch University, and I'm a postdoc um, there. And yeah, today I'm going to be talking to you about uh, this talk titled Tracing Innovation and Identity in Early African Nationalism with Computational Social Science. But before I start, um, I thought I'd talk a little bit about my own journey to digital humanities and computational social science. And in this talk in general, I'm uh, kind of going to be, I guess, flying high over uh, a lot of different things. Um, and I imagine that uh, people are at all sorts of different levels. Um, and so for those who are coming into this, um, you know, I'm coming from my particular direction. And that direction started me out uh, with a kind of interest in African intellectual traditions. Um, in my master's work, I focused on the writing of one uh, closer intellectual, Isikan Kai. And uh, uh, this kind of got me interested um, in this area. And as I started my PhD work, I really got interested in the larger community um, and started looking at a group of intellectuals who were uh, thinking about and developing new political vision in this emergence of early African nationalism in South Africa. Um, and so the approaches in this field are often much more um, kind of humanistic. It's an interest in the sets of ideas, this uh, development of new political vision or new imagination, the kind of meanings that are emerging in this community. Um, and the approaches that uh, I kind of came through with were these close textual analyses um, and intellectual history, thinking about the, the writing and the biographies of key intellectuals. Uh, but I'm also trained as a sociologist, and um, I got really quite excited in some of the opportunities that digital humanities and computational social sciences tools can offer to see things in new ways. Um, and I think that maybe that's what draws many of us here, this a kind of promise of the possibility that turning to a different set of methods and to new kind of emerging sets of data might offer us to see things uh, from new perspectives to uh, make Make new discoveries. Uh, and so in this talk here today, I kind of want to talk about some examples of how in my own work, digital humanities and computational social sciences tools have uh, allowed me to ask and answer new questions and kind of give you a little bit of a, a taster of some ways that uh, you might see uh, these tools allowing you to think about and answer new questions in your own work. And so as I do that, my second goal is just going to be to showcase a little bit of my work. And I'm kind of going to be uh, flying high, not going too deep into any uh, particular area, um, but uh, giving you a little taste of how these methods might allow new perspectives in our research. So a little bit of a roadmap. I'm going to talk about three things here uh, today. I'm going to be talking about some work we're doing digitizing historical Isikosa texts. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, methods of network analysis and also uh, methods of computational text analysis that I'm using in my work. So first, um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about some of the data that's underpinning this talk, but some of the digitizing work that we're doing. I'm involved with a larger team at UCT. Um, Sanyan is here. He's also involved in this project, um, as well as um, others at UCT. And we're digitizing uh, these early um, historical Isikosa texts. So this is both newspapers and books. And so what we have so far is um, these first African-headed newspapers in South Africa. This is Isikademi Samaklosa. Uh, and Invo Zabansundu, two uh, kind of early and important uh, Klosa newspapers. And so, so far we've collected uh, 25 years um, of uh, newspapers, which we are hosting online, uh, running from 1870 to 1894, uh, over 7 million words of uh, newspapers. Uh, but this is something that we're really wanting to grow. There are other newspapers we wanted to continue to digitize, we wanted to continue to expand the scope. So this is still very much in progress, but uh, some progress is uh, being made here already. Um, and we're also collecting uh, classics of early uh, Klosa literature. Uh, so, so far we've got Semkin Komo Magwalandini by Hubusana and Ityala Lama Wele by Isike um, And these are kind of early classic texts of uh, Klosa literature, but they also reveal uh, some of the interests and the ideas of this intellectual community of this time. And so in this digitizing work, we're wanting to make this all uh, publicly available and accessible. Uh, in my own work, you know, these materials are often hard to get access to. Um, and, uh, you know, and if you do get access to them, well, when you're in the archive, they're just kind of uh, there on the page. We're wanting to digitize these to make them available, but also make them available in electronic format so that people can work with these materials, kind of enabling research going forward. So. Uh, if anyone's interested in that, feel free to, I've got the web address uh, over there, but you can also just Google uh, Is it Closer Intellectual Traditions Archive, and you should be able to find it, and you can download um, these um, uh, digital texts there. Um, yeah. 
So I'm using this as the root of everything that I'm talking to you about today. Uh, but I want to talk to you about two methods. And the first is network analysis. And so network analysis offers us this exciting set of tools to study the social connections uh, in society. And so we all kind of have a vague sense that these uh, social connections are important, are impactful. Uh, we've all heard it's not what you know, it's who you know, or people talking about networking. But what network analysis offers us is uh, a set of tools to kind of formalize the study of social connections. Um, and before it's a specific set of methods, it's also a way of seeing the world, seeing the social world, um, that we are shifting our attention from just individuals to seeing individuals bound in a web of interconnections and thinking about how that set of social ties shapes uh, the lives of individuals or larger communities. And so then network analysis offers us a set of tools on the one hand for visualizing, but also for quantifying, making visible, but also calculating this otherwise invisible structure of social connections. So here's just an example of how I'm using this in my own work. And so what you're seeing in this graph here is uh, these networks, these emerging political networks of early African nationalist social and political organizations. And this is in this period, 1870 to 1890. So what are you seeing here? Well, these large circles are showing these social and political organizations. And we've got a whole bunch of different spheres um, here. We've got education organizations, we've got citizen or civic organizations, often self-help um, political organizations. We've got this uh, one newspaper, and then we've got these kind of early emerging political organizations. Um, and we're also seeing in these smaller dots those people who are members of these organizations. And so really what this network is showing is how organizations were connected to each other by sharing members across this emerging, um, growing space of politics. Um, and so, you know, here uh, we can uh, show all sorts of things with these networks. And one uh, example of that here is uh, you can see in these uh, members, these smaller dots, I'm also showing those members in this network who are uh, ordained ministers or reverence. Uh, you can see those in blue, as well as chiefs or headsmen shown in red. And I won't get into it, but you can see how um, visualizing the structure of the network can offer interesting insights into the kinds of social connections. Who's more socially close or more socially distant from um, other people? And here we're seeing this kind of social closeness or distance shown as spatial closeness or distance in this network. So to step back from what you're seeing, to give you a little taste of how I got here, well, I got um, interested and excited by these political organizations, looking at the work of Andre Odendahl, who studies uh, these political organizations, and he's uh, uh, not so recently anymore, but recently Ish published uh, The Founders, uh, a kind of history of this early period. And that got me quite excited about these organizations. And he talked kind of metaphorically about some of these networks emerging. And um, with this, ooh, uh, uh, with this kind of like uh, inspiration, I went back to these newspapers that I talked about, uh, Isigadimi Samaklosa and Imvo Zabansundu, and worked to reconstruct these organizations and their members. So I was looking at newspaper reporting to gather this membership. Um, and uh, what I have here, which uh, fingers crossed we'll come back in a little bit, um, uh, this gave me a network, a kind of data set of uh, 19 political organizations and uh, 585 members. Uh, but what we were seeing there was just those members who were connecting across the network. So then what does that show us? Well, it shows us how uh, interconnections amongst these political organizations were beginning to be formed. Um, and without the slides, uh, the, uh, so you're going to have to, maybe I'll uh, show you them when they come back, but, but maybe just to uh, kind of talk off the cuff then a little bit more. Uh, we can use these uh, uh, kind of network data to do all sorts of things. Um, and one thing that I... Uh, fingers crossed, we'll show you in a little bit, is we can explore the different sub-communities, the kinds of uh, local connections, the kind of stronger subgroups within these networks using a range of community detection algorithms. And uh, in my own work, what this showed me uh, was that we're seeing a network here of a number of different local movements, much more closely connected to each other, um, as local movements are emerging, but they're beginning to begin, they're beginning to connect across these different movements, uh, forming this wider network. So we see a form of innovation here that kind of transforms politics from these colonial emission styles. But 
again, hopefully I will flip back and show you, on the edges of this network, we see something else going on. We see a number of, a number of much more rural political organizations. And these organizations kind of assert an identity around a kind of Isizwe identity, a national or ethnic identity. And so you have Tembu organizations, you have Mfengu organizations, you have uh, Nguika organizations. And in these organizations, we see a different kind of innovation. We see innovation that is starting to happen as uh, rural political leaders and their rural communities start to partner with and pair with missionary educated leaders. And now you're bringing together different strategies, different ideas of politics into these new contexts and creating a kind of an innovation in this new way. And so just one example of what that is, uh, is uh, there's an organization called the Tembu um, Association. And this organization ge generated some of this earliest um, pet mass petition politics in South Africa. So how did this kind of innovation come about? Well, you had missionary educated leaders who were familiar with this form of petitioning to make demands to the Cape Parliament. But petitions were always small groups of people uh, writing in their demands. Uh, and these missionary educated leaders connected with rural leaders and much larger communities were able to generate some of the earliest mass petition politics um, as large communities were mobilized. And in this context, uh, it was Tembu communities struggling against land disappropriation. Um, uh, working using this form of making demands on the Cape Parliament through petitioning as a kind of innovative political strategy. Um, things are going to get really tricky now because the next part that I wanted to talk to you about is uh, computational text analysis. Um, and this is very visual, so maybe I'm just going to be waving my hands around for you. Um, absolutely. Sounds great. Perfect. I wonder if I can, yeah. So, Any questions for the first couple of days? I just project. We have a lot of time to go for it. So um, I think that the way that I think about it is that these two exciting things here. The one is, yes, they're really on new ways of seeing that um, traditional approaches haven't been able to see, right? And that's incredibly exciting. And I think that um, uh, people, uh, you know, the hope is uh, this new way of seeing gives us something really fundamentally exciting and new. On the other hand, I think that for me at least, these methods can really partner with, they don't replace, but they go hand in hand with these existing methods, right? Um, and maybe I'll uh, talk more about this in this computational text analysis part. Um, but the thing that's really quite exciting is that it's a different perspective that can share with these older approaches, right? So here are the uh, sub-communities. I'm just going to fly through this. Uh, here are the sub-communities. And here we're seeing in blue these uh, mission... Thanks. Uh, these organizations emerging from these mission contexts. In red, we're seeing these uh, more rural organizations. And I don't have time to talk about it now, but there's also fascinating new connections beginning to happen across these different subdomains that enable uh, this movement to hold together much more uh, coherently, creating a unified um, early African nationalist movement. So. Computational text analysis, and uh, for the sake of time, I'll quickly skip over the slide, but we're back to the newspapers here, and one thing that's really exciting is uh, we can, so traditional approaches, especially from uh, kind of the tradition that I come from, have focused in on individuals, on their writings, on biography, and that is deep, wonderful, important, and fantastic work, but sometimes it leaves out the way that a larger community is collectively participating, shaping ideas together in a kind of larger dynamic dialogue. And so I'm wanting to use computational text analysis approaches here to try and reveal some of that community uh, collective discussion. And I'm using frequency analysis here, and so um, this uh, talk on uh, um, counting text, finding, searching for finding a text and counting, this is really um, the route that I'm using here. I'm looking at um, how frequent different sets of root words in Klosa are being used over this time period to think about the different attention of this community over time. What is the community attending to? How are people collectively talking about identity? And so this can be used in all sorts of ways, but I'm going to be focusing in on uh, collective political identity formation here. And this graph here, which I uh, won't go into in detail, just shows that many different ideas which we might think of as uh, really central to emerging nationalism, 
ideas of uh, race, ethnicity, and nationhood are all in this interesting dynamic transformation in uh, using a range of different uh, closer words, rising and falling in frequency. There's really a debate in this community around the central terms, the central ideas of understanding this community. So one way to show that is just to focus in here on uh, different languages of a shared blackness or a shared Africanness. And so what I'm looking at here is these two uh, closer root words, uh, Nsundu and Mnyama. And uh, so uh, Nsundu directly translates into English as dark brown, as in Abantu Abansundu, and Mnyama directly translates as black, as in Abantu Abamnyama. Um, and the graphs that you're seeing here are the shifting frequencies of these two words at the top, Nsundu, at the bottom, Nyama. So just to tell you what you're seeing here, um, in orange, we've got the Isigadimi newspaper. And then in blue, we've got Imvo, which was founded later in um, 1884. And each of these dots shows the newspaper for a month uh, and looking at the frequency of terms used there. Now, in Isigadimi, it was published monthly for most of the time. So each of these dots is mostly uh, one edition of the newspaper. Um, but Envo was published weekly. So here we're grouping uh, four, often four newspapers together into one month's analysis. And what I'm looking at is the frequency of this focal word that I'm looking at as a percentage of all other words used to normalize across these uh, different potential lengths. And then this line is just a weighted moving average. So we're seeing the trends in this shifting language over time. So what are we seeing? Well, Nsundu identity really begins as the more dominant uh, use. Um, but it interestingly declines into this middle period. And at that same time, we're seeing the surging rise of the use of um, this Mnyama root, of Mnyama identity, uh, kind of really rising to the fore. But then this too begins to fade away and Nsundu identity surges back to the fore. And it surges really strongly in Imvo, in blue, but also it's uh, coming back uh, strongly in Isigadimi, although not as strongly. So we're seeing this really surprising shift in these different languages, each which have their own kinds of connotations and meanings. Um, and uh, one kind of key thing to note here is that uh, Nsundu is talked about by some scholars as um, being a pre-colonial and uh, kind of emic is a closer term for skin color. Uh, whereas Mnyama um, has been spoken of as kind of really uh, engaging, taking up much more explicitly these racial categories of colonialism. Uh, much like black and white are kind of metaphorically paired, Mnyama and Mplope have this uh, kind of uh, uh, pairing, metaphorical pairing. And so it calls attention to this racism of the colonial context. So we're seeing the shift, um, and certainly I wasn't expecting it when I came to this. Um, I don't think that this was expected in the literature. What is going on here? Um, how can we understand this? Well, what I want to do now is kind of unfold a couple of different steps to visualize some of the sources that are shaping the shift in discussion. And first, I want to shift our attention. And uh, so before, in color, we were seeing newspapers. We're now using color to show who the editors were of these different papers. And so in purple, we had the first uh, mission editor um, of Isigadimi. And then in green, we see the first African editor of the paper, Elijah Makiwane. And then in orange, we see this really important role played by John Tango Jabavu. And uh, Jabavu was really a central, important figure in this kind of emerging political domain. So what are we seeing here? Well, um, under both mission editorship, but also under this first African editor, Nsundo identity was really the common uh, term. Um, but it began to decline. But at the same time as it was declining, we could see at this bottom graph, nothing really was going on with this Mnyama identity. But that really changed when Jabavu took over. And we can see that Jabavu is really playing an influential role as the editor in promoting this shared of a Mnyama identity um, in this newspaper, in his role as the editor. Um, and it surges during uh, his editorship. But something happens. Mnyama doesn't stick. And so, and we can see, so Jabavu begins as the editor of Isigadimi, but he takes over and founds the first independently uh, black owned and run newspaper, Envo Zabansundu. And we can see him in, in orange here, we're following him across this editorship. And we can see that he shifts um, and his newspaper now promotes an Nsundu identity. And one way that we can really see this is in the title that he chooses for his new paper, he calls it Envo Zabansundu, note the Nsundu there, meaning black or African opinion. So why can we uh, see this shift from this promotion of Mnyama identity to this uh, kind of transformation and shift back to Nsundu identity? Well, let's turn to another set of visualizations which make another set of social processes visible here. 
And so to quickly give you a little historical context, in the 1880s, African voter mobilization was this powerful tool that this proto-nationalist community began to use to try to uh, assert and defend African rights in the Cape Parliament. So what was going on? Well, um, there was no racial distinction in franchise at this time period. But in order to be able to register and to vote, you needed to have a certain income threshold or you needed to own a certain amount of property or land. And so the opportunity for engaging the Cape Parliament here was spearheaded by mission-educated political leaders, but the mission-educated community was small and by and large didn't own enough property or earn enough income to register to vote in large numbers. But a great opportunity uh, lay in mobilizing rural plus people, uh, rural African voters who qualified to vote on the basis of their rural land holdings. So, we're visualizing some of these important elements here. The first is these blue horizontal lines uh, show the sessions of the Cape Parliament. 1879, there was a new session, 1894, sorry, 1884 and 1889. Um, but, uh, so we, there was really a surge throughout the 1880s, but in 1887 there was this new threat to African voters. Uh, there was new legislation which was attempting to disenfranchise particularly rural African voters by stripping away this right to vote on the basis of having shared communal land tenure. Uh, and so there was this uh, was a, a threat to this growing wave of mobilization. So what you're seeing in highlighted in red is the time period that these laws were being discussed in the Cape Parliament and they were passed at that end of that period in red. And then highlighted in blue is the lead up to this 1889 election. So what are we seeing then with all of this? Well, the first thing is there was no real uh, mobilizing around African voters um, in the late 70s and we see no real shift in this language around that very first election. But by the election of 1884, we can see that Myanmar identity is really surging to the fore at this period in the lead up to this election. But we see something else too, which is that Nsundu, which reaches its lowest point at the end of 1882, turns around for the first time in, the, in that year lead up to that election. And through 1883, in the lead up to this election, begins to rise. And after that election, Myanmar identity kind of begins to fall away. In fact, it falls away quite rapidly. Um, and Sundu identity surges to the fore, and it really is shown to be clearly linked to the struggle for African voter mobilization in this disenfranchisement period. You can see there in blue, Imvo is showing uh, the highest spike in this discussion, this use of um, Abansundu identity. Um, but we can see also in Isigadimi, just afterwards, they caught on a little bit late, but once the laws had passed, they also had a surge of discussion um, about uh, Nsundu identity tied to debates around laws, disenfranchisement, and voting. And we can see in Mnyama, especially in this blue period in the lead up to this final election, it's almost a suppression of Mnyama identity as Nsundo identity becomes the dominant shared identity to mobilize a community around uh, voting. So I uh, would love to go deeper into this if there were time, but for now, uh, let me just tell you that what we're seeing here then, at least this is really pointing to the way that uh, something is going on around Nsundo identity. And there's two things here. The one is that, uh, long uh, kind of political organizations that existed from the early 80s were using this Nsundo identity much more. Um, and they were also uh, really mobilizing African voters. But it also kind of suggests that uh, rural voters who were so central in this um, election campaigning uh, were really resonating more with this Nsundo identity, an identity that may have existed in a kind of uh, uh, closer emic conception that existed before colonialism. Whereas for those mission educated leaders, black and white was really the confrontation that they were experiencing, um, but this wasn't as resonant for uh, rural voters. Uh, at least this is kind of suggesting in this direction. But we also see two things. The one is we see the influence of elites in this community. We see the influence of intellectuals. We see that Jababu is able to mobilize a around a racial language um, and build a community that's thinking about identity in bigger terms than uh, other local identities. He's building around an Myanmar identity. But we're also seeing that there's a decisive impact here, an influence, and really here the de decisive influence of this larger community participating in this debate. It's these long-lasting political organizations and it's this larger rural community that uh, Nsundo identity really seems to resonate much more with. Um, and so Jabavu switches and takes up this Nsundo identity and this becomes for a time a kind of unifying shared identity of this growing African nationalism. So let me conclude. Um, 
Just by saying that what I've wanted to show you here is that there are some quite exciting opportunities to use new methods and new data to reveal new perspectives um, as we engage these long-lasting questions which have been important to us. And the methods I'm showing to you today are not particularly uh, new uh, in time, but we can take these methods that have been established and begin to bring them into new contexts to answer uh, humanistic questions in new ways. Um, and so I've talked a little bit about uh, the, exciting, uh, the excitement of being able to digitize, uh, in, in, in this case, uh, across the language newspapers, but creating data that we can share, and this has already been uh, kind of emphasized here, creating data that we can share that uh, many people can uh, draw on uh, and explore. Um, and I've just wanted to show you a little tidbit of these two uh, methods that I use. Network analysis, which here shows us how these social connections shape innovation in this uh, emerging political community. And computational text analysis, which tells the same story, but now from a different perspective, showing us the shared ideas being generated in this community. And really, instead of only seeing uh, individual intellectuals and leaders, we're seeing this uh, influence of a community in dialogue together, turning to a range of isoclosa terms to create a sense of identity in this uh, closer epistemological framework of this time. Uh, so I will leave it there. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate your attention. Great questions. I think these show a lot of interesting possibilities once uh, the resources are digital and this is um, a comment from one of our virtual participants. Fascinating insights, Jonathan. I have also been looking at the differences in how Imvo and Abantu Bato, Yosmyama and Nsundu, mm -hmm. and liken it to the difference between talking about black people without initial capitalization and then black people with initial capitalization mm -hmm. in modern day terms, roughly. Mm -hmm. The one is a description, whereas the other is an embodied identity. The way you visualized the shift graphically is fascinating and makes so much sense in the light of the developments you're explaining. So that was from Sisanda Nkwala, and then there is another one, oh, I do hope I'm pronouncing these people's names correctly. Uh, Nontubeko Kwai uh, is uh, asking, who is your major users for the archived Isitosa newspapers? Great. Uh, well, thank you, Sisanda. That's uh, wonderful, and I would love to talk more with you. Um, so let's make that happen. I'll find you and send you an email. Um, yeah, so I think that we come from a particular background when we're digitizing this work. Um, it's a kind of um, historical and sociological background, but we're wanting to think uh, about sharing this with the community as widely as possible. Um, and so, you know, I can imagine that there are historians, there are people engaged in linguistics, there are people engaged in uh, sociology, there are people engaged in political science. I'm, I'm, I, I hope that these materials could be exciting and useful to a very wide audience. Um, and we're still in the process of developing this, so I think, uh, you know, something that uh, we will need to be thinking with is how to make this most accessible to people from different disciplines. Do we need to uh, produce the materials in different kinds of ways? So we're still very much in process, but we're hoping that um, by making this available, researchers from a range of fields can ask their own questions uh, from their own disciplinary perspectives. Um, so really, hopefully as wide as possible is, is the short answer. Uh, th thank you very much. Um, I, I come from some kind of media studies background, so I, I really see the value of, um, you know, computational analysis, the frequency analysis that that um, that that you use. But I'm a bit worried by how you account for the changes in the terms of those uh, particular discourses yeah. in, the, in the newspaper. Uh, because the, I, I feel there are other, what could I say, uh, if, if I take on what you call a sociological uh, approach to news production, mm. you may find that there may be other intra-organizational dynamics that would have been taking place at that at, at these different points in time through which you could also account for these shifts. So in as much as I appreciate the, the, the patterns, I, I, I think computational analysis is very good in terms of showing us the patterns. 
but may not be, there may be a challenge in terms of accounting yes. for those patterns. Mm -hmm. Because I'm, I'm worried about cap, coming up with some reductionist you know, interpretation mm -hmm. of those patterns. Yeah. Well, what would be your view on that? Yeah, I, I think that this is fantastic, and I think that um, my feeling is that we can never get away from the need for real interpretive depth to make sense of this kind of stuff. Um, and so, I mean, I, you know, my direct answer to this would be uh, we're seeing some set of patterns here, but I don't think that this is the only uh, um, explanatory factor, right? And certainly there are other political dynamics going on here, especially between Jababu and many other members of this community, uh, which may also have played a role. So I think that your, your uh, pointing to these inter-organizational uh, inter dynamics is certainly uh, an important feature. Um, and, but I think that a key here is that, you know, interpreting this is always going to require deep, uh, almost qualitative, at least kind of historically rich and deep knowledge. Um, and so there isn't any ever the way to just throw it into the machine and take what it spits out and hope that that just is the end of the story. Um, I'm even in choosing the words that I've chosen and, and visualizing certain events have made particular interpretive choices um, in dialogue with and responding to a larger um, kind of historical and literary um, set of literatures. Um, and so I think that it is, is absolutely central. Uh, any of this work needs to be deeply grounded in an awareness of and a development of those interpretive tools alongside a development of the visualizing or uh, kind of computational tools, which, as you say, show patterns but don't tell us what those patterns mean. So I think that that's absolutely central. Great. Uh, before we go to our next colleague, yeah, I think this is a very good example of the question on value. What value add can digital humanities bring? And the aspect that the data is open, other people can interrogate it, you can get access to it, you don't necessarily need to be at the archive at UCT, you can access it from anywhere. The tools that's being used is mostly open source tools, so you can interrogate that, you can see why it might choose certain things, why it might throw other things away. So that I think it also alludes to this idea of value add. It's really democratizing and opening up data and opening up access and interrogation thereof out of different perspectives. So I mean, I just wanted to link that to your earlier question. But this is, I think, a good example of that. Um, then we have our next uh, question, yeah? Thanks, uh, Jonathan, for your presentation. Speaking about accessibility of the data, I've got two questions. One, uh, how accessible were these uh, newspapers? And what was your process of gaining you know, access to the newspapers? And then secondly, what was your process of identifying those organizations, either political or social? Yeah, great, thank you. Um, so, uh, yeah, the digitizing process has been a, a, a whole thing of its own. Um, we are primarily working with um, uh, uh, NLSA, National Library South Africa, um, and they have hard copies, and so primarily we are um, working with them and buying, uh, digitized versions of these hard copies, which we are then taking and digitizing and hosting online in this digital format. Um, and so they keep the rights to those uh, digital scans, um, but uh, we are able to do whatever we want with uh, those uh, um, kind of the digitized um, output. And so this has really been uh, made possible by a kind of larger funding project, funding um, African Digital Humanities uh, Archives, um, a project that's um, being funded through uh, Mellon and run through uh, Wiser um, at the moment is, is where we got funding for this. But uh, we had to pay for it all along the way. We have a team of people who are then doing this digitizing work and checking the things. Um, and so in part, this was a quite intensive thing. And that also is the reason to really make it easily publicly available because uh, when things are kind of behind paywalls, it limits what researchers can do, and the people who earn money from keeping them behind paywalls win out of that, but researchers don't win. And so we've wanted to you know, use that to make these things publicly available. Um, but I think that we've found ways that, you know, uh, thankfully we had some funding, but um, with that kind of funding, we've been able to find ways to work with local archives um, to, be, to begin to do some of this digitizing work. Um, the second question was about identifying the organizations. And so uh, I think that they were, so primarily here I am a kind of, uh, really kind of leaning on and in dialogue with um, Andre Odendahl's work here. And he is uh, one of these uh, historians who's been in this data for 30 or 40 years um, and kind of knows it like the back of his hand. And so the place where I started was looking at some of the organizations he was uh, talking about and kind of following those back 
to the newspapers, um, and then uh, through a range of different searches, identifying uh, uh, articles that were talking about those organizations. Um, and so what that led me to, you know, these newspapers sometimes report leading members, sometimes they report delegates, sometimes they report people who participated, spoke, uh, uh, gave a report on this or on that in these newspapers. And so that was how I got to the membership from identifying those organizations. We also then looked for other organizations in these newspapers um, to kind of uh, supplement that. Um, and sometimes, you know, sometimes those were a, a different name for the same kind of organization. Maybe sometimes these were um, organizations that um, weren't discussed in that uh, historical work. But that was the, the approach that I used. Um, and again, maybe it speaks back to the kind of interpretive point uh, that this work is kind of happening in dialogue with uh, the historical literature or the literary um, analyses that other scholars have also done um, in order to kind of uh, uh, develop a kind of a, a shared uh, foundation. Oh, yeah. Okay. 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 Um, are there any? Oh, right, yeah. Thank you. Um, my name is Douglas. I'm from Wikimedia South Africa. We represent uh, Wikipedia editors in South Africa. Um, you mentioned that you are making uh, the original source material uh, publicly available uh, online. Uh, where, where is that being hosted online? And what, what type of public access are you talking about? Is it like, um, like a copyright, a CC0 Creative Commons sort of open copyright, anyone can take it? Or is there something a bit more restrictive than that? Is it in a purely digital form or are these scans? Um, just sort of those kind of details, thanks. Great, um, so uh, I can't uh, pull up that uh, web address, but it's hosted on, uh, and sitting right uh, close to you in the green shirt is um, Sanyan, who's the uh, expert uh, uh, on uh, the hosting at UCT in this area, but it's hosted on uh, a UCT um, website called Ibali, uh, which is running on Omeka S, and what we are doing there is uh, making, uh, so we are converting these uh, uh, images uh, into OCR uh, text documents, Word documents to preserve the um, layout of the newspaper. Um, and we're making those available and I believe it is uh, whatever the CC that uh, you can't use it for uh, financial gain uh, uh, licenses. Um, yeah, 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 NC, NC, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So that's my, I, I believe that that is the, the only restriction that we are wanting to put on this, in part because it's those commercial organizations that are uh, paywalling uh, researchers and locking them out from access to this kind of material. So uh, we're wanting this to be uh, kind of publicly and freely um, available. Um, and yeah, uh, and you can download these uh, text documents uh, from this website and at the moment we're in a kind of yearly cycle where we are digitizing and then uh, kind of expanding the archive. Uh, uh, once a year we upload a, you know, the new set that we've done. Um, but as I say, we've got 25 years up there and it's in this uh, Word document format and so that's what people have to work with for now. Um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, publicly available. Thank you so much. Um, and just to mention that all these questions are not only directed to Jonathan. If you have something to say, some input, some comments. I'd love to talk to, to anybody and everybody. Um, so thank you. Thanks so much for that. I think we will then breach uh, into our uh, presentation. I think party started this morning, not by myself. Um, so I'm going to around Escalator, it's uh, Champions Initiative, um, it's DH Ignite, and the stakeholder map uh, as we breach for that. We've just got confirmation from uh, the kitchen that they would be ready for us at half past 12. Um, we have received confirmation from the kitchen that they will be only ready for us at half past 12. 
I think the power outage has also influenced the um, prepping capabilities. So we will be uh, finishing our presentation and then doing the presentation on data in the, digital, uh, in, in the humanities so that we can still keep on track and um, uh, keep with the program as we planned. So the part that I want to lead us into, uh, we shared a little bit about DH Ignite. You saw the type of discussions that, that's happening here, showing the type of examples. I think Jonathan's talk is very practical in that sense. It shows the different people involved. You need people to digitize. You need people to make sure the data sets are there. You need some people to do research on the data sets to create awareness. The tools, the training, there's a lot of different elements to making something like that happen. So another part that we now want to introduce about the whole escalator program is the stakeholder map. Uh, the stakeholder map is a place that essentially aggregates contacts. So if you approve that your detail can go in there, people can see that you have a particular interest, let's say, in media. Um, and if you want collaborators that also want to work on media, there's maybe funding proposals that you need a broader range of partners that needs to take part, you would be able to find that type of connections within the stakeholder map. The stakeholder map itself is not just about having names of people with certain expertise in it. It's also about um, allowing people knowledge about certain data sets, as the one that was now just shared. So that if you're a student, or if you have a class of students, you can point them to this and say, how does this match with the historical record? Because this is exactly, I think, what the uh, DH domain offers. It really offers an opportunity to relook and confirm certain interpretations of the past, but now you have the benefit of additional data that's more readily accessible and that can be interrogated in, in creative fashions. Uh, do you want to share a bit more about the stakeholder map? So I hope I didn't take all the talking points. <laughs> now leaving you. Okay, so um, again, going back to the stakeholder map. So basically, and, and John, because John is the expert, he usually says the, you know, the high, level things and I am here to just you know break it down a little bit um, <laughs> so basically the stakeholder map so we call it the DHCSS stakeholder map and basically what we want to do with that map is collect information on activities that are happening in the digital humanities and computational sciences space in South Africa um, and this map collects basically data on people projects, institutions, training materials, resources. So basically, what we want to do, not only to put you on the map, but to create resources for everyone else. So as John has mentioned that we want to, and as we have mentioned also earlier, that one of the things that we really want to do is to grow a community. Um, make sure that there's room for collaboration. Make sure that you know where to go if you're looking for people to collaborate with. And then, um, the other thing is that we'd like everyone, like to request everyone to go onto the Escalator website, add your data. It's literally a five minute form. And what you'll be asked is your name, your affiliation, what you're interested in, what you're working on, and the tools that you use, basically. And that's what we're collecting. And why is this important? Why is this important? Prof um, Ru mentioned that we are piggy banking on work that's already being done. So say you are a master's student and you're looking for maybe topics of research or you wanna start with your research and you don't know, and maybe I should make this an interactive session. So from all the talks we've received today, Prof Ru talking about sharing, talking about piggy banking on information that's already available, how do you think this map could be useful? So we've already told you what is on the map, um, how to, now from the, Little, the little that you know. How do you think this can be useful? Any takers, anybody. So you go onto a map, you add your name, your surname, your email, what you're working on, what you're interested in. You are in UCT. How do you think this information can help someone else? I am working on Isikosa language, um, and now I forgot, <laughs> newspapers. Um, and I know that there is the stakeholder map. I go there, I look for Jonathan, I find information there about him, 
and I can say, hey, Jonathan, I ran into a problem. How do you help me solve this? So again, collaboration. So not only for you to be out there and be known, but also to go to a place where you find help. So I have a chemical engineering background and so we're coming into Escalator, especially in an environment where software and tools is being introduced. When I was in varsity, they said, oh, for this assignment, you're going to use this tool. Good luck. And I come into the digital humanities space, and it's so amazing how most of the time people don't know where to start. Most of the time people don't know who to contact with regards to where to find information, what tools they should use, because obviously we are in the information age where there is Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Um, so we are in the information. Um, now I lost my train of thought. Information phase, and um, there is a lot of information. So it's good to say, oh, I know from the stakeholder map there is, I don't know, Vanessa who is not. Oh, Vanessa Chen. There is Vanessa Chen who is working on this project, and these are the tools she's using. So I can reach out to her and say, hey. Um, how do I get started with this? What, where can I start? And as we go through the day, we will be mentioning some of the pro programs that we run in Escalator that are similar to this of basically giving you a starting point in your journey. Yes, and that really helps that you know that you're not alone in this. You're not alone on this new journey. So we did a little bit of DH magic. You know, we talked about analog approaches and then now we apply some computational methods and lo and behold, lunch is ready. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag DH works.